Hello everyone, welcome back. And it's very pl great pleasure here today to be joined by Ian Hutton, our first venture offshore to Lord Howe Island. Hi Ian, how are you? Hi Simon, very good. So Ian, would you like to tell us a little bit about your background uh, and your particular connection to Lord Howe Island? Well, I grew up in Sydney on the Northern Beach area and um, joined the Weather Bureau to get out of Sydney and travel Australia. And in 1980, I came to Lord Howe Island on a two-year posting. I thought, well, two years would be nice on that uh, remote island. And uh, that was in 1980, two years, and I'm still here 40 years later. So that, that's how I arrived here. And I have uh, moved on from the Weather Bureau, and I, like most people here, wear a few hats through the week. So two days of the week, I'm the museum curator. We have this lovely museum that I'm sitting in, and I uh, get involved with tourism, wildlife tourism, and uh, some research projects. I've been lucky enough to work with researchers in many different fields from many countries. So the uh, sort of role I have here, um, everything dovetails in the museum, the tours, the research, and uh, everything sort of dovetail into a nice nice lifestyle out here. So when we first met a few years ago, you were working on seabird projects. I'm, I'm guessing the fact that you're there on the islands, uh, often when researchers come and set up projects, you, you get the, the luxury and pleasure of continuing some of that work in between their visits sometimes. Um, so you get to work with all these beautiful birds that use the islands for nesting. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, what's so special about offshore islands. Why do they uh, become these sort of hubs of a particular seabird and other sort of endemic bird activities? Why are birds such a, it plays such an important role in those islands? Well, a small remote island has a big moat around it and Lord Howe Island, in fact, has a, a 500 kilometre moat and some animal groups don't cross that moat very well. Birds, of course, can fly, so they arrive, but mammals don't. So Lord Howe Island has only ever had one mammal. It's a tiny insect-eating bat. So without mammal predators, uh, birds come to these islands and they can breed in safety. So these uh, offshore islands are havens for seabirds. And Lord Howe Island has more seabirds breeding than anywhere else in Australia, really. I think uh, 14 different species and probably several hundred thousand seabirds each year breeding. But tell, tell me, uh, just to describe for people who don't know the area, just describe me to me a little bit about the landscape of Lord Howe Island. Well, it is a very dramatic landscape, and from anywhere you are on the island, the two mountains dominate uh, 771 metres and 875 metres high. So the island is dominated by those mountains. Uh, rainforest covers the island. There's the world's most southerly coral reef, and that encloses a beautiful lagoon. So the island is uh, blessed by being in a certain latitude where it uh, gets abundant rainfall, it gets warm water coming down in the East Australian current, and life does proliferate here, whether it's on the land or in the sea. Great proliferation of life, marine life, birds, plants, invertebrates. And with a lot of government uh, protection, probably since the 1870s, and the local population caring for their island, it's one of the most pristine habitated islands in the world. There's still 85% of the island's natural forest left. Hmm. So you've been involved um, for a number of years now in a, in a rather ambitious and large project uh, to eradicate rats from the island. Um, I think people are, are probably generally aware of the problem of rats on, on remote islands. It's probably had enough media now in the world. But the significance of that for um, the local species, the seabirds and so on, uh, uh, perhaps that's often underestimated in people's minds. Can you t tell me a little bit about from your experience the last 30 years being on the island, what, is, what have you seen rats do and what um, do you think the process that you've just gone through is going to be able to achieve for the island's ecology? 
the rats got here in 1918, so they have been here 100 years. And when I did come to the island, the rat population was thought to be between 80,000 and 120,000 rats, and probably a similar number of mice living on the island. And if you do Google how much does a rat eat in one day, it's 15 grams. So if we just run it off, 100,000 rats eating 15 grams of biodiversity each day, um, my maths is not that good, but it is a fair amount of biodiversity that rats and, again, mice have been consuming. So nine land birds have disappeared from Lord Howe Island and five of them attributed to the rats. We have two plant species extinct and rats are uh, the culprits and quite a number of large invertebrates. But it's not just the extinctions, it's the rats and mice eating all that biodiversity each night. The numbers of birds, for example, are suppressed because the rats would be eating eggs and chicks of birds. But also, the rats would be eating the food resource of many of the land birds. So now that the rats have been eradicated, that food resource is going to be available for the many land birds. And just in the 12 months uh, since the rat eradication more or less started, it, it started in May of last year, the helicopters flew in June and July, so you could say it's been about nearly a year. No rats have been sighted for six months. There's ongoing searches with uh, monitoring devices, with dog, um, dogs that are trained to sniff for rats and mice. No uh, live rat has been found for six months, so it's assumed it's been a success. And the results are just amazing. Everybody on the island, all the householders, are uh, reporting more land birds around their houses. The white eyes, the currawongs, the wood hens. Um, here they are with chicks in June, and that was unheard of. So we've got uh, lots of families of people with the uh, wood hens in their, in their houses. Um, the plant life, I was on Mount Gower in February, camping overnight there, several nights, and the amount of seedlings coming up from the ground now, where maybe they haven't been for 100 years with rat eating all the seed. So the regrowth of uh, plant life is phenomenal. And uh, invertebrate on Mount Gower Summit, previously camping up there at night, you might search for half an hour to an hour and see one large slug crawling on a tree trunk. And just outside our campsite, there was one tree that had about 45 on mm. this. So very dramatic results showing up already. Uh, and we do hope to see a lot more of the benefits of this program just coming out in the next few years, particularly for bird life. That's... Um impact of, of rat eradication is being iterated across island systems uh, in many parts of the world. Um, I think we're at, at almost at the epicentre of some of the skills with that. I think some of our New Zealand counterparts have become very adept at rat eradication. As you say, the, the impacts are, are pretty immediate on some of the smaller um, fauna, um, but it also has flow on effects for the whole ecosystem. So I'm, I'm surprised to hear that you say that the, you're already seeing plant life also uh, benefit and I'm assuming that we're also going to see fish life as well benefit from you know increasing seabird numbers because the seabirds get killed by the rats as well don't they? Oh yeah the seabirds um, are preyed upon by that, particularly smaller burrowing petrels mm. that have evolved breeding on these remote islands where they've never seen a predator and it, it was really uh, heart rendering to go to these seabird colonies and find the, the dead birds, the, the rats just go down the bar and eat the chicks, eat the eggs. But also we did have masked owls introduced to the island in the 1920s, obviously to eat the rats, yes. and we've also died on the seabirds, and part of the rat eradication has been to remove those owls. So combination of no rats, no owls, the seabird numbers are proliferating and we will see a lot more of that. And the owls probably pushed two seabird species off the island in the 1920s. Uh, Keith Hindwood, famous ornithologist, was here in 1931. He didn't record them breeding. The white-bellied storm petrel and the 
think at all. But both of those had been recorded breeding on the island in 1915, just prior to rats arriving. So um, we do expect very soon to see white-bellied storm petrels and Kermit petrels breeding back on the main island because they did survive on the little offshore stacks around Lord Howe. Now, as we're, as we're talking about that, so we, we've, we've, you've mentioned a few birds, Lord Howe Island wood hen, it's a flightless bird. Um, obviously, islands are, are quite in, famous for their flightless birds, but you, you have got a, a, an animal on Lord Howe Island, which is particularly special. Um, it's almost like the dodo of, uh, of Lord Howe. In fact, it was considered extinct for many, many years. Those offshore islands where the white-bellied storm petrels and the Kermadec petrels still still breed, um, there's a story, isn't there, that connects those islands, um, and which are rat-free, and this particular, the rediscovery of this particularly unique animal. Do you want to tell me about that? That's right. Lord Howe Island's rather fortunate. There's quite a number of little islets and rock stacks around the island that have been rat-free. So the white-bellied storm petrel, the permadec petrel, have been able to breed on those areas in safety. And a number of invertebrates, it's a number of beetles, spiders uh, that were wiped out by the rats on Lord Howe Island, but they're surviving. And probably the most dramatic of those and the one that's received worldwide attention is what's called the Lord Howe Island phasmid, a large stick insect. So they were thought to be extinct by probably the 1930s following rats arriving. But in 1964, David Roots, the first rock climber to lead a party on the Balls Pyramid, he photographed a dead stick insect. And it did turn out to be one of those phasmids. He didn't know at the time. But uh, after the, the trip, he casually took his photographs to the Australian Museum and the scientists really uh, leapt with joy there because there was a phasmid still surviving. It did take some time, but in 2001, a National Parks expedition did uh, go ashore at Ball's Pyramid at night and they did find phasmids. So it was a great uh, story for science, rediscovering something thought to be extinct. Melbourne Zoo have undertaken a very comprehensive breeding program. Of course, nobody had ever bred these things in the past, so they were just learning all the time, but they were successful, and they have several hundred of these phasmids at Melbourne Zoo. And when the rat eradication has been confirmed as a success, which will be two years following its implementation, that's the international protocol, um, the phasmids will slowly be reintroduced back onto Lord Howe Island. However, there are some phasmids on the island. They're not out in the wild. We at Lord Howe Island Museum have some under licence from Melbourne Zoo to keep here to show the public because it's a, been a great story. Sir David Attenborough has been filmed at Melbourne Zoo handling one of these phasmids. And I have got a little enclosure here with a couple in. I'll, I'll just get one out please, for you. Please do. I'm, I'm very excited by this. This is almost like, be, like being there and seeing the real thing. Because what we're about to see is something that's not what people think a stick insect is like. These are, this, is a, this is a piece of megafauna from a remote island. An enormous animal. Look at that. Do you want to hold it up close to the, close to the camera, Ian? And it did for a while have the name Land Lobster. You can see why it gets that name. You can also see why a rat would love to eat one of those. Quite a nice chunky meal, one phasmid. And um, just extraordinary creatures. A bit like the wood hen, really. They did, uh, or their ancestors did have wings, and that's how they arrived at Lord Howe Island. But not needing wings, because there are no predators here to eat them, they lost the wings. So they were quite uh, safe here for millions of years, but again, once rats arrived, they disappeared. But what a great success story. And uh, nearly everybody that comes to Lord Howe Island uh, for a holiday just loves to come and see these. So we have got a, a small enclosure on display at the museum, and people can have them climb around like this. They're, they're not at all scratchy. They don't bite, and uh, very easy animals to keep. They just graze on a range of rainforest leaves. So we just replenish the leaves about twice a week. And this uh, one here, this is a male. It's got very big, chunky back legs. The males have those. 
uh, and it's a sixth generation phasmid, so we have had them breeding here for about 15 years. They're laying eggs, hatching, and this is a sixth generation uh, museum one. <laughs> it looks like a handful. Um, so you were saying, so two two years time, you're, you're hoping in two years time, the the uh, hopefully officially the island will be rat free. Um, if that's the case, these animals will be reintroduced, and then uh, we, how long do you think it would be before people could expect to see Lord Howe Island stick insects climbing around in the trees naturally on the island? I think within the first year they're going to proliferate. Uh, the females drop eggs continuously through the summer months, so probably five, six months in the year they're dropping eggs and um, and they hatch and without the, the, the rats to eat them, then they they will um, breed and grow up in numbers. And the adult ones are nocturnal, so they're black, they live in splits in the trees during the day, but at night they come out and crawl around. The juvenile ones, they're, they're green and they're diurnal, so during mm. the day they probably will see the green ones. But at night, uh, I imagine going out with a torch, you'll see them. Uh, just like we go out now, we see quite a number of moths and, and large beetles. Lord Howe Island has 530 different beetle species, and already they're showing signs of increasing too without that rapidation. And as a final, a final point, uh, this is just the beginning, obviously. So it, a, a rat-free island uh, enables you to um, recreate the conditions that would have gone past. Now, um, just quickly tell us how, what, what bird species we've lost in the past and what, is there anything that can be done about any of those? Sure. Well, because there were no uh, predators, uh, uh, mammal predators arrived at Lord Howe Island, the birds here became very unafraid and uh, they very quickly succumbed to the uh, impacts of humans here. The humans uh, shot some and ate them into extinction, so a large pigeon and a white gallinule were shot by the early sailors coming here. They shot those for food. Um, the early settlers came and we had a, a beautiful little red crown parakeet living in the forest. It would raid the garden crops so the island who shot that one, 1869. That disappeared. And then when the rats got here, we had five land birds disappeared. We had a fantail, a gerigony, a large white eye, an island thrush and an island blackbird. And then the last bird to disappear was the subspecies of the blue book owl that disappeared in the 1950s, probably outcompeted by the big mustard. But the really exciting thing is those birds that we lost, uh, at least seven of them, maybe eight, are living on other islands around the Tasman Sea, particularly Norfolk Island. So for many years now, um, there has been talk on the island and among scientists, well, wouldn't it be nice when the rats have gone to look at bringing some of these similar species back? And of course, on Norfolk Island, they, they do have problems with uh, cats and dogs and rats still, so to have some of the surrogates of uh, Norfolk Island birds here on Lord Howe Island as a, a reserve population will also benefit that species. So that's a very exciting thing that will be unrolled probably the next five years on Lord Island. Well, Ian, it, it's as always, it's been an immense pleasure to talk to you. I, and one of the things that I'm, I, I'm just it, it, it really, I, I think really, I'm obviously very grateful to you for, for all the work you and all your colleagues do, but it's also really nice to hear a story where someone's lived in a place for so long and your, your career, uh, is is reaching a crescendo which is actually a positive one seeing the rehabilitation and rewilding of some of these places uh, i think it's, it's quite a unique and, and wonderful thing to have been part of so I'm, I'm thank you very much for sharing your insights with us quite okay son Good. and hopefully see see you soon <laughs> yep I'm um, and obviously, uh, anyone who's watching, uh, you can find out plenty about Lord Howe Island uh, by visiting the website. Um, Lord Howe Island has, it has its own website. Uh, look up Ian Hutton online. You can find many things about Ian, including videos of him working with people like David Attenborough and 
various various conservationists um uh, follow wild diaries and uh get in touch uh with any of us if you'd like any to know any more information many thanks again ian have a great day add one more thing if of i can course. the island has been down with tourism but on the 3rd of august the island will be open uh, to tourism with the usual social distancing rules going on very good and i think that's that's it's definitely going to be for an island that depends a lot on tourism that's going to be a, a real breath of fresh air i think for for, for everyone so i'm um, thank you again i'll uh, look forward to catching up again soon ian thanks Take simon care. bye